This episode is brought to you by Tony Robbins and his inspirational quote, I used to achieve to be happy. Now, I happily achieve what? Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. Hello, my people! Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, where I welcome people with remarkable stories for amazingly vulnerable conversations. I am Stefan Dyer, former banker turned comedian and lifestyle entrepreneur, and welcome to season two. Oh my god! Episode 51, Namas y Caballeros, the first 50 episodes were amazing. Half a century. I mean, it's just been like, a, what a crazy journey. I, I had this idea for months, and then I shared it with my wife. And then my wife, in about 48 hours, had bought all the equipment, and the podcast was born. Then I hired uh, Maria and Maureen, who are designers and lettering experts. Then I talked to Eme to do the, the outfit for the cover, Carlos Bolivar, to do, who is the editor of the podcast, but he also did the pictures of the podcast. And then I spoke to Gonzo Music to do the little jingle that you just heard. And then the podcast was born. So thank you for 50 episodes of support. And, I mean, any feedback, any comments that you can send us would be so, so highly appreciated. If you have any comment, especially which episodes you love the most, which guests you love most, what part of the episode do you like, what uh, what can we improve on, send a DM at Stefan Dyer on Instagram or email us to the Stefan Dyer Podcast at gmail.com. And here's to another 50 episodes, ladies and gentlemen. Cheers to that. This episode 51 with Alejandro Ejea was, oh my God. Season 2, episode 51 with Alejandro Ejea was a masterclass on how to be intentional about life. You know when people say, Hey, when I'm on my deathbed, I don't want to look back and regret this and that. Okay, this episode is about that, exactly that. Being intentional about today so tomorrow you don't regret anything. It's planning, it's enjoying, it's gratitude, it's embracing your mistakes, it's learning on the job. It's everything that Alejandro says on this episode. All of his stories are so powerful. We talk about achieving a life by design. Purpose, intentionality, what it means to be man enough, vulnerability, happiness, empathy, compassion, his father's last days. Oh my God, that was beautiful. How he found happiness after uh, Alejandro's father was diagnosed with a critical illness, life planning, loving oneself, his beautiful and he healthy relationship with his partner, Ariana, and traditions with his mom and brother. Growth mindset, life friendships, like, and so much more. But you may be thinking, who is Alejandro Ejea? Who is Alejandro Ejea? Who is this great character? Alejandro Ejea is a CEO on demand, passionate about supporting business owners to improve their operational results and quality of life through st strategic, technical, and emotional support. I've never seen emotional support on a bio. And I love that. Very original. Alejandro has 12 years of experience in business strategy, entrepreneurship, and strategy advice in private and non-for-profit organizations. He's held roles both in executive and board positions. Interested in participating in challenging projects that, pr that produce a sustainable economic and social impact through planning, strategy, innovation, constant learning, and a high component of personal and professional growth. That is Alejandro Hell, ladies and gentlemen. If you like this episode, share it. I mean, you're going to love it anyways, but share it. Don't just love it. Share it. Give us a review, five stars. Screenshot it on your Instagram stories and tag us at Stefan Dyer and Aegea X. Oh, and also, I said this in the past, but you can now watch the episodes on Spotify video because Spotify now has... Spotify video podcast, so you can see the video of us talking on the podcast. Shout out to Carlos Bolivar, our amazing editor. And now let's get it started, ladies and gentlemen. He's an entrepreneur. He's a coach. He's the intentionality king. He's my childhood friend. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy this episode with Alejandro Ejea. 
like I know you will. In three, two, one, go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Stefan Dyer podcast. I have here the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the highly capable, the intentionality king. My great friend, Alejandro Ejea, how are you, my brother? I, I, I actually wanted to have this podcast on a Monday morning because I knew it was going to be the best way of starting the, <laughs> the week. <laughs> and with that introduction, even better. So, so I'm ecstatic. I, I'm so happy. <laughs> Dude, I'm so the- happy too. I, I wanted to have me it, it, when I get to the first meeting with a client. I wanted to introduce me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. I at the beginning, you know, when I was starting the podcast fifty episodes ago. I much. know. I saw it. I saw it. I, I was. Yeah. I, was, I, I wanted to talk today about consistency, and uh, and I saw that you were fifty, and probably soon to fifty-two. So it's amazing. So congratulations to you. Thank you, man. Thank you. I tried to create something where I could be unapologetically myself. So I'm like, how am I going to talk? Am I going to be like super funny, like a comedian? Or am I going to be myself? Or am I going to be super serious? Or am I going to be analytical? I'm just like, I'm going to be myself. And every time I, I meet I meet my friends or I, I hang out with you or or I meet somebody else and I love putting nicknames on people and like adjectives and and hype them up. So I always start the podcast like this and I'm excited about it. I know it's amazing. Like uh, we've known each other since we were kids, but we have m- known about each other's life through Facebook and then yeah. Instagram and probably soon TikTok. Um <laughs> If we're not old enough, <laughs> but uh, I always loved how you always with your friends in college and in your work and in your stories, it's always like El Tigre, El Esto, the legend. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you know, I want Stefan to, to, to say something about me. And I was just like, record. OK, I'm so I think I'm just going to record this first section of the of the podcast <laughs> and I'm going to hear it every day in the morning. You know, and I'm going to be just <laughs> killing it. <laughs> I'm my own hype man. And I like to be so like my friend Diego always says that I'm I I always hype people up. So listen, I'm going to continue hyping you up because a, a tradition of the podcast is I always tell people why I invited them. And in this second season, I'm calling this these se- second 50 set of episodes, the second season. And that tradition is not going to be lost. So in the second season, you're starting it. And wow. I immediately thought of you because, first of all, we've shared pretty much our entire lives together. We went to school in Costa Rica. We grew up together. I moved from Costa Rica to El Salvador when I was 10. But we pretty much shared, I don't remember since when we know each other, but I know first, second, third, and fourth grade we did together at the Blue Valley School in Costa Rica and in uh, in Escazú. And I grew up going to your house. I My first memories are playing with you, Andres, Silvan, Antonio, all our friends, and playing chess in your house with, with dad. your dad who taught us. Your mom welcomed us. I, I, I remember meeting Mao. And, and it was like um, one of the one of the homes where I'm like, this is a really lovely place. You know, I remember you you used to live far away from Escazú and then really close to Escazú in Trejo Montelegre, right? Yeah. I, I, I live like 30 minutes from San Jose uh, in Heredia. And now I live like five minutes from your house, which I remember perfectly in front of Exotica next to Rostipollos. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And then as we've aged, not that we're 80 or whatever, but we're still uh, 34, I believe. 34. And you're one of those guys that I feel has always had your shit together. Like, obviously, we all go through hardships and we all always go through through pain and in order to grow and everything. But it seems like you understood the task at hand when it comes to life. And you're like, I have to be intentional. I have to be vulnerable. 
I'm not going to derive my self-worth from money. And looking at your career path, I can clearly tell that you, you started to get it. 2006 to 2010, you went to Spain, to the Universidad de Navarra. But while there, you still lived in Pamplona, Madrid. You went to Hong Kong and Atlanta on exchange. Then you came back to the motherland, like most of us do. And you worked in, in the corporate life, investment banking, in Mesoamerica Investments. Then you're like, well, I mean, you're going to correct me, but you're like, well, I, I want to do something more meaningful, I guess. And then you moved on to the Fundación Quirostanzi, Quirostanzi that did great things. I remember you took actually, you took computers, hundreds and th thousands of computers to the rural, rural areas of Costa Rica. Then you worked a year at Nas Nasacolo, Nakascolo Holdings. And then from 2016 and on, you went to the entrepreneur life to work with small and medium-sized enterprises with Halo CEO on demand. So while we're going to dig deep into your, your career and everything, every time we talk, <clears throat> it's like, it's none of this, like, not that it's bad or anything, but every time you and I talk, it's not. None of this bullshit like, hey, what's up? Yeah, no, no, no. It's like, me, like, hey, man, I really appreciate you. I love you. How's your family? But it's not like, hey, how's your family? No, no, it's like, I really care about how's your family. And, and that's why I'm so happy to have you here because I really want to dig deep what's behind this intentionality. A, coined, uh, a term that I coined that I stole from you Life by design, I always use it, and you, you, you actually told it to me first. So I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you and, and just understand the why behind the what and the how. Wow. <laughs> I think that the, the cool thing about this is that every time that we speak, I feel such a mutual admiration and respect for each other and high vulnerability that I think that every time we talk, Like the other sees a lot of things that probably we don't see, right? Yeah. Like, like there's such a big imposter syndrome on one end. And then we just like tend to get deep into how we admire what the other has done. And then yeah. at a certain point, like that's what I'm going to say. Like every time we talk, I'm also like in the middle of what am I doing with my life? You know, like, <laughs> am I doing the right thing? Uh, and then like, like I hear you speak or we go through what we're doing and it's just like, It's worth it, you know. It's it's just like worth it, not knowing what you're doing, but but yes. having that certainty that probably your quality of life, the quality of your relationships, uh, your well-being, uh, and 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 really like things that are very Costa Rican, or in your case with having Peruvian mother and living in El Salvador and Mexico and everything, like it it's so close to our heart, right? Uh, and then it's it's very nice that we always treasure so much our friends and our family in such a high manner, because I, I think that whatever you do, what really matters to me is that you're happy, uh, that you're yeah. proud and, and that you are giving yourself everything first to yourself, then to Narce and to Liam and, and then to your surroundings. So, so it's pretty crazy because uh, we don't speak that much, but when we speak, it's like yeah. we just yeah. saw each other the day before and we really, go deep into our, our relationship and and that's just simply amazing i love it and to me the people that i respect obviously you included when sometimes they're like am i doing the right thing is this the path that i want to take am i actually being intentional with the things i'm doing and then the and the other person who we admire in this case, you or, or, or me in your case, we like, dude, I'm so proud of you. It's like, oh, because if somebody that I don't respect says it, I'm like, yeah, okay, thank you. I thank you for saying that. But I don't, it's not that I don't value your opinion, but it's not coming from someone that I deeply respect. So I feel like if somebody that you deeply respect says it, you give it more weight than if somebody who just like you just met a couple of days ago, you know? Yeah. So that really, that really resonates. I hadn't thought about it that way, but it a hundred percent. I want to, I want to start by asking you the term that I stole from you, which is life by design. 
and intentionality, living your life with intentionality and purpose. I, I feel like you're one of those guys that you're decades ahead of the game in terms of maturity and intentionality. And, you know, a lot of people reach their 60s and 70s and they're like, oh, fuck, man, I, I should have had more coffee with my mom and my brother, you know, or, or, or and my mom, my, my, my mom's husband and my brother or lunch or maybe, man, I work too hard and I spent only 2% of my time with, with relationships that I value. What, what, what life is that? So was there a specific time in your life? Was it your childhood? Was it university in Spain? Was it the, when you were in the investment banking where you're like, hmm, something's not right here. I, I have to pause, step away from the wall because I'm too close to it right now that I can't see things with perspective. And I have to reassess what's important to me in life. Yeah. Was it there a specific moment or was it gradual for you? I, I think it's all of the above, um, but but in, 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 I, I'll, I'll try to structure it in different ways. First, family-wise. So I lost my father. Uh, this year is going to be almost 15 years. And I remember how big of a change he had in his life once he was told he had, uh, he had a disease that evolved from anemia to leukemia. So that, that really made him a, a big stop because my father was himself a businessman and an entrepreneur. When he, when he passed away, I opened his laptop and he had 22 items that he was working on from completely different things, you know? Uh, I, I, and I think it was very difficult for him when he went to the doctor and the doctor told him, listen, like you really need to make a hard stop to whatever you're doing professionally because your health and your life depends on it. Uh, and I remember that prior for, of, of him being that uh, ill, my relationship with him was not as good as it was after he got that, that disease, right? Because essentially that disease showed him and, and, and he, he, he made a, a presentation uh, that that was called a new life opportunity. That after he got this the disease, uh, he gave to all his friends, his business people, and his family, in which he essentially said, "Listen, before I got ill, I dedicated ninety nine percent of my time towards my profession, towards my business, towards a lot of initiatives, and then after I got ill, I really reconnected with my family, with God, and with my friends." And he was always, you know, like a very present father. He was always a very good friend and stuff, but but he wasn't there, you know? And so I thankfully saw him not regret, but rather re redirect his life towards what was meaningful. And for the five years that he was ill, I think that we were able to develop and nurture a really meaningful relationship. So I, I, I can say that before he got ill, like I saw him like that father that would come to, to from work and continue working, that he would always be talking to me about how important it was to get good grades. But after he got ill, we really became friends, you know? And when I was studying abroad and everything, like he was very nice because I was fulfilling a life, a long life dream of him for one end, but other, he was my friend. And, and so that's something that I have intentionally designed in my life. And it's like this, like the thing I fear most is that I have to get to a point in my life uh, where I live the same thing as my father, that because of working a lot, because I'm passionate about it, I really miss the things that are important to me. So that would be on the family side. On the professional end, uh, when you're introducing me, I, I got the opportunity to earn a scholarship to go study to Spain. Uh, and I was originally intended to study business and law. Uh, but when I was flying towards Spain in the middle of the Atlantic, I was like, what the hell am I doing studying law? That, that, like, that seems so boring. <laughs> like, I hate reading so much. No, no, no. Like, I don't want to do that, you know? So it was like kind of an aha moment where I really got to, you know, uh, really be very courageous and go to the people that granted me the scholarship because I was one out of many, many applicants that they gave it to me. And I was like, listen, like, I'm so happy to study over here, but I don't want to study law. 
And you can imagine their face. They were like, what the hell? You know, like we originally denied your scholarship. Then you guys called, you made a case. Like we moved <laughs> heaven and air for that. Uh, and you were the only one that got into these cars from all over the world. And now you're telling me that you don't want to study law. <laughs> and, and then that was the moment where I was like, well, I could have been a very good lawyer because I was like, well, the whole scholarship is about having people that are happy, right? Why would you got, want me to grant me a scholarship if I'm not happy studying that? That wouldn't make sense, right? And they were like, damn, you're good. <laughs> So somehow uh, I still have that lawyer in me. Uh, but I think that was, that was something like really cool that like even in the finish line in Costa Rica, we say in the Sapriora, just like when, when the referee is about to whistle off, like you can change what you're doing. Um, and then thirdly, when I began my, my, my professional career, I remember I was having lunch uh, and I was having lunch. And then like the what, one of the founders of the company came and sat down and I was like, you know, like, 22 years old, dining, well, or having lunch with a business legend respected a lot in, in whole Central America. And I was like, okay, okay, what do I ask him? Why do I ask him? And I was like, listen, uh, Mr. Harry, Harry Strachan. I was like, if I could make you a question, like it, it would be, um, if, if you were my age, what would be something that you would advise me to do that you would like to live up to now that you are almost 70? And he was like, listen, like whatever you do, spend your money on memories, uh, invest your money, your money in memories, don't spend it on things. And I think that ever since I heard that, like I've seen life in that prism of collecting memories, of nurturing relationships. And also I'm knowing that the value of wealth is not related to status or the amount of money that you have, but more on the liberty that it allows you. And so ever since, uh, you know, like there have been many times in my life where I've been just like, wow, like this is such a big game changer from passing from investment banking to going to a, to, to a, a directing an NGO. And for me, it has always been what makes me smile the most at the moment. You know, like very clear that you can screw up and that you will probably screw up. That, but that if, if you take a decision and then it's all like in the moment, it seemed like it was something that made me happy. I mean, you can go wrong, but at least you went to something that made you happy. So, so I think those yeah. are the three things that have made me really intentional on, on, on living a life where I don't know if it's going to work or not, but at least it makes me happy. What a fucking masterclass you just gave on. Like, we could just finish the podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Correct me if I'm well. Obviously, I I completely agree with what you said because there's a there's a element of the decision that you control, and whatever happens that you that you cannot control, but the decision you can, and it's the right decision, regardless of what happens in the future. You could be miserable like with that decision later, but the decision with the with with the information available to you at the time. It's also the the it's the best decision you could have made. It's investing in yourself. And because you're sure it's gonna make you smile, chances are it will pay off because being unhappy is unproductive. So the best thing that you can do is invest in yourself so that you can be happy. And as a result, you will do great, great things, in my opinion. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you go, was it to Peru or was it to Southeast Asia for like six months or like a year? Both. How much, how long was that? <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay. Both. Okay. So, so, so that's the crazy thing. Um, when I, I, I mean like when Mr. Harry Strachan told me, Spe invest your money in memories. I was like, fuck yeah, I'm going to travel. <laughs> like it doesn't matter where, you know, like, the, the pandemic came and I, I think I really get to travel to Costa Rica, you know, just because it wasn't possible to go abroad. Um, but but yeah, essentially, when I finished working in a Cascolo uh, Holdings, like I, I was crushed, you know, because I was so happy and and it was the best decision for the company because they wanted to go to real estate. And I really don't know much about real estate, but for other, it, it just like hurt my ego. It hurt it, you know, like my 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 plans, like I, I was just thinking, okay, I'm going to be the CEO of this family office. And this is like my career path and I'm settled in, in, in different ways. 
And so I remember when I was talking to my former boss that he was telling me like, listen, like we think the best decision is to hire a new CEO and focus on their strategy that we work with you and stuff. And I was, you know, sitting there like a very difficult decision. I was, oh man, I'm going to travel. <laughs> like I want to <laughs> go to Thailand. Like it's messed up, you know, because it's like it, if, if you're losing your security or your job, like so many things around it. Uh, and I remember I went to have pizza with my family, like immediately, like it was so like, it, it wasn't planned. And I arrived, you know, and my mom was like, like, so how are you doing? And and I was just eating a slice and I was like, well, I'm going to go travel to Thailand and Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and what about your job? Oh, yeah, well, sorry. Like, uh, I'm living in Cascolo. I don't know what I'm doing to my life, but I'm going to travel. <laughs> and that was so crazy. But at the moment, it was so cool because, you know, like, we live in a world where a lot of our worth is derived from our status, from our work, from, from security. But yeah. if we're able to embrace uncertainty in a way of saying like this, like we can be happy even though if we don't have things figured out. And in my case, it was like, man, like I, I, I could really need a break and I could really just, you know, like feel free to do whatever I want. It's going, it's, it's going to be something interesting you know so it was crazy because everybody you know was like well, well, well what happened what are you gonna do next like do you want the job and and the crazy thing was like two days later uh a good friend of my mom knew that i didn't have a job um and so she told someone that was a managing partner in a big consulting firm she called me she said like listen like like well she interviewed me and stuff uh when we were having the interview we went around the offices and there was like the managing partner and she was like this is alejandro he's going to be the, uh, a partner i'm sure like in the next five years and stuff and i was like whoa whoa you know like <laughs> like oh it's chill you know uh, but it was crazy because from a rational sense like life was telling this like you can have a very good job with salary with a good salary with good conditions with status or you just can go travel the world and see what happens, you know? So what? that was like a big, meaningful moment in life. And, and that's where I want to go to. Because something that I learned last year in a, in a workshop was that we always have the freedom of choosing. Even when we think we can't, like we are in, so ingrained in something that seems like you don't have a decision, a possibility of choosing, you always can do it, right? So, so for me, it was the easiest decision in my life when I called her and I was like, listen, Rocio, like, thank you very much for the offer. Thank you very much for all the things that we discussed. Uh, but I'm in a moment in my life where I can say no to you, but I cannot say no to myself. And that was so big, you know, so, so, so big because I was literally embracing uncertainty. I was really saying like, Ali, it's going to be okay. Even if I didn't know if it was going to be okay. Uh, and it really showed me that I value myself more than I thought, you know? So that yeah. was, that was really crazy. And then somehow life always have the way of just, uh, like congratulating you on it. So I think like two or three days after that, uh, I was on Google and I was like, okay, I want to go to Thailand. So I started Google, uh, flights and I used the matrix things. And so I was originally intended to travel to Thailand for two weeks. It was like a $1,300 ticket. And I was, you know, going to book and I was like, mm, okay, let's just play around. And so I started playing with the, with the, with that matrix that essentially shows you the prices and you can go moving, moving yes. and show you how it's changing. So then I got to a ticket that was $1,000 for six weeks. And I was like, oh man, wow. Like that seems cool. Okay. So I'm going to reserve it. So I reserve it and it had 24 hours to decide. And, you know, I was just going to stand up from my computer and, and then I was like, mm, maybe I should look if there's something cheaper, you know? And so <laughs> I, I'm there, I'm there. And then somehow I get to a 645 ticket that it was for nine weeks. And I was like, okay, I'm going to reserve this <laughs> one as well. And then I'm going to see what happens. Uh, long story short, I reserve. And then all of a sudden I receive a ticket, uh, an email notification. Your ticket has been bought. And I, what, what? And it was a non-refundable ticket. So I had to go nine weeks to travel, you know? And that was so cool because I had freedom within my freedom. You know, it's like, I didn't intend it not to have a job. I didn't intend it to say no to a big job offer. And I didn't intend it to have nine weeks for myself in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and, and that by itself was amazing because it ended up really cool during those 
weeks, like the first weeks, I was so, 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 so stressed about knowing what I was going to do next, that I was mentally and creatively blocked. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of India, I was driving, the, going to a beautiful temple, and then I started writing and writing and writing five business ideas. So throughout the second part of my trip, I decided I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I'm going to start developing those business uh, cases or business plans for these companies. And when I arrived to Costa Rica, uh, I executed three of those ideas. And one of those is the one that I currently work with. And then the other two were really interesting of just saying, well, like I, at least I tried and it didn't work. So yeah, crazy. That's insane. You know, listening to you, I it reminds me of the fact that one of the best and most key ingredients to productivity is mental clarity. And it's it's so hard to be productive when you have 3,000 things in your mind. But ironically, one of the best things for your life, for your health, for your well-being, and for your business could be to take a month off, a year off, you know? When you have that mental clarity to step away from the wall and see the entire panorama you know and and the other thing is when you talk about valuing yourself more than the dollar amount of a year's worth salary for example when i when i was in at scotia bank i when i decided to quit in 2016 i was going to quit the next year i i knew six months in advance In January of 2017, I met up with a guy who, who was a VP in, in risk management. And he offered me the job, my dream job, which was to, I had been trying to get, I had already interviewed and I didn't get it. And I, it, he's like, dude, it's yours. And basically, if, if you go through this process again, it's yours. And I would, would have worked as a senior manager in risk management, which means if you did well there for a few years, you would be sent to a country. And my dream at the time, or for, for, for the longest time, was to do that so that I could come back like a big dog to Costa Rica and be mm -hmm. with my family. But at that time, my, prior, my priorities had changed. I had changed. And in, I remember at the Starbucks of Scotia Plaza, he's like, um, dude, if you basically, he's like, if you want it, you, you have it, you know? And I said, no, uh, thank you so much, man. But I'm, I'm quitting. And he's like, what? You're going to the competition to the bank, to another bank, to RBC or to TD or to CIBC or, or what? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to be a comedian. And he's like, what? <laughs> That's amazing. He yeah. was like so happy for me. It's like almost like save, save yourself while you can, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Run away and never come back. <laughs> yeah and, and i remember my birthday in 2016 my mom and my my mom's husband Hector, had come to spend my birthday with me and and i and i had already made the decision and Hector asked me like what if they doubled your salary would you stay if they threw at you like two hundred thousand dollars a year would you stay i'm like no what if three hundred thousand i'm like no i wouldn't stay for and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe if 10 million, I would stay, but, but it's, it wasn't a thing about money. And that's when, you know, because yeah. there's, there's a lots of things that money can't buy. And I know that I say this, and maybe we, we say this uh, sitting on a bed of privilege and, and I, and I acknowledge that. And we're very grateful and lucky to be able to say, Hey, I have a, like an incredible solid plan B. Like I can go do whatever. And I still have a career. I still graduate university. I still have all these contacts, this wealth of knowledge that the worst thing that could happen to me is I just go back to the bank in a year's worth time if this whole thing didn't work out, you know? So um, I'm very grateful and, and, and we're very grateful and lucky for the opportunities that we've had. But then again, it's so important to know where you're sitting, where you're standing in that moment and what's best for you. Could, could you elaborate just, I think a year, couple of years ago, you told me about setting up this tradition of lunch with your mom and Mao, or was it coffee? Yeah. And okay, how, how did this come about? So, so first um, I want to talk about you 
And I want to talk about how you have been an incredible inspiration for me. And I'm not saying it just because I'm in your podcast and because you're my friend, but because of how unique and important it is to have friends yeah. that you can really get courage from, you know? So obviously your story is a crazy story, but you're a crazy guy. <laughs> you're a tigre, you know? <laughs> you, 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 you were in a tiger costume in the middle uh, in, at the end of New Year's in Costa Rica, just like creating a, a, an incredible, crazy thing. Uh, but, but above all, I think that we, um, and, and we talked about this many times, like it's so important to have friends that we admire, that yeah. we respect, and that we just love to see what's going on Because I remember your when, when you're in college and then when you were posting your 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 vines and your yeah. very funny stuff uh, and then how you would always make fun about you working in Scotia Bank and all serious and you know like I can remember that perfectly and I think that the best validation uh, is when you have someone that is offering you something so good and you're able to see in their face like I would love to have the courage to do that. Just because I think we need more of that uniqueness, of that authenticity, of that courage uh, in the world. Because, and, and I think that's something that has really, really helped me uh, is to share what I do, not because I'm doing something good or bad, but because we need inspiration. You know, like yeah. why so many people every day like to share or, or follow pages on Instagram that are daily motivations that are talking about habits, about productivity that where we see others and we, we like to, to compare or learn from that because we are social creatures in which we, we need that hope, right? We, we need that possibility and that could be myself. And when yeah. you come from a prey, a real place of admiration, not only, uh, well, maybe I am a bit envious, like, wow, how cool Stefan, he has his comedy, he has his podcast, he has his family, but but there's so much courage and, and there are so many things in between that is so important to have and nurture these kind of relationships. And, and I really and I really love the way that you share your stories on Facebook and on Instagram, because even though we don't talk a lot, like I, I love your vision board. Like you, I had you in one of my programs like two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic and you were just like sh saying like, listen, I passed from investment banking or from banking to comedy with a plan, you know, like, and, and, yeah. and I'm always doing that. And I think that's so important because um, habits and consistency is really what makes, you know, good, good from better and better from best, you know, because it's something where you have to really intend what you're doing. So in my case, and going back to your question, um, like five years ago, I learned about this wheel of life, which essentially helps you understand uh, what are the areas of your life and try to make like a self-diagnosis of how you're doing on it. And so the first time I did this wheel of life, uh, you can put it on, on Google and it's just like essentially like a wheel. And then you say, okay, like in my, my part, I have one of the important parts of my life is myself, my relationship, Alejandro with Alejandro. And then I, I like to analyze it in a mental, in a spiritual, in a, you know, like how much rest I have. Then my relationship with my life partner, which Ari, uh, then with my family, then with friends, then with my profession, then with my community, then with my financial well-being. And so when I started doing that, I noticed that I didn't feel like I was doing good with my family. So it was like, okay, like what's something that I can do that can really help me connect with my family? So we started doing every Monday night having a family dinner. It would be once a week in my house and once, once a week in my mom's house. And that has given us like a lot of connection because it would be like that time of the week that everybody uh, with my clients or with my friends and every, everybody knew that Monday was something cool. And I started, you know, like posting pictures on it and stuff. And I said, Hey, so people would randomly tell me on Sunday, what are you going to cook tomorrow? And I was like, I don't know. Do you have any idea? <laughs> so it ended up being something really nice. But I think like if we have daily habits, like for me, I, I, I connected a bit late for the podcast because I was making coffee every day. I make myself coffee. And that's, that's like my, 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 my morning routine. Uh, and I think that that's something that little by little makes you and sets you apart, not from others, but with yourself, because you are able to see 
how you've grown ever since you've consistently been doing that. And over the years, you've had like not a name for the for the year, but something new that you want to try. For example, a couple of years ago, or, or no, 2020, I think, you decided that it would be the year of learning how to make incredible cappuccinos, incredible coffee. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So every year, uh, ever since I think it was 2016 that I made the big trip, uh, I always put like, this is something that I want to do this year. And it's been really nice because some have been learning a new skill, like getting my scuba diving license, uh, becoming a barista. Uh, but I think that in the last two years with the pandemic, things have been more interior growth. So last year, uh, I, I, something that I really intended was to develop a high quality relationship with whom is now my girlfriend, uh, and hopefully soon, you know, something else. Um, but but I think like when 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 we got across each other, and when I decided to invite her to go out, like I said, like man, like this is something I've been really wanting. So it was interesting because. I was single for five years. So in those single years, I traveled the world. I went to the World Cup, as you can see behind me. I learned how to do barism. I learned how to do scuba dive. But then I started doing, you know, like curses on myself. So I take a nonviolent uh, communication course, which is life changing. I also take some courses on becoming your best, etc., which was good and personal growth. But then when I met Ariana, I was like, listen, like this has to be my priority. And so it's been really cool because the intentions for each year have been from something outside to things that are more interior. Yeah. And I think that that is so, so cool because essentially when I met her, I realized that all the things that I've been doing beforehand is really cool because she knows that I love to do crazy things. So yesterday we were doing life planning uh, she and her, uh, she and me. And so we were just like, okay, what are things that are important to both of us? Adventure. Great. We want to learn new things. Great. You know, so it's everything that I prioritize in my life is now coming into my future. So, so that's a very crazy yeah. idea. I, I fucking love it. No oh, man. So many great things. First of all, I think self-awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself because otherwise, if you, if you don't know yourself, it's very hard to make decisions that will give you long-term satisfaction because otherwise you're living somebody else's life. Now, a lot of people think that because we, because Stefan lives inside this body that I know Stefan, but, but it's not true. Like I have to make a conscious effort to get to know myself and get to understand the things that I value, get to understand the things that piss me off, get to understand my fears, get to uh, like this past year, I, I started for the first time after like so many personal growth and so many courses, I started seeing a therapist for, for the first time since I'm like 10 when I moved to El Salvador and I started to understand myself more. And, and I like to say that I, what I really want is to do a master class on myself in life. You know, I want to approach, because I think you run into problems a lot when you derive your self-worth and your satisfaction from external things. Oh, if, but if you derive it from internal things, for, if it comes internally, that's more recurrent, that's more sustainable. That's, that's long-term. And I, and I, man, so good. So good. The no, other thing I, that, I, I, go ahead. That, that, that you're saying, um, I want to share something very personal, but I think like the beginning of, of, of this interior journey began when I, I was like very insistently invited to take a self-growing course, course. And I was like very agnostic, you know, like, no, I'm, you know, I'm doing okay. Okay. Well, okay. I'll do it. Like they, they made me a good discount. <laughs> I didn't have much to do on the weekend. So, I mean, what could go wrong? Uh, but I, I received the people that had done it and I said, like, listen, Ali, go do it. And if you don't like it, I'll pay, I pay the course for you. And I was like, okay, it's $1,000. So if I don't like it, it's going to be good, you know, <laughs> but essentially <laughs> Uh, when I did it, it was a very, very, very tough weekend because I realized exactly what you said, that I was living a life to impress others or that was based on the impression of others. And the most important part was that 
and I really cried like a baby is that I realized that I didn't love myself, you know, like, you know, myself, you, you know, yeah. me, I, I really like to, to, to be there for my friends. And I'm always loving to be in a party and make people laugh and stuff. Yeah. But it was so heartbreaking when I real, realized that I didn't love myself, you know, like, like I, I, that I hadn't told myself, Ali, I love you. You know, like it seems crazy. Right. But, yeah. but that was just like a, a, a big low in my life because I realized that I hadn't put myself as a priority and that yeah. I was living someone else's life. And that that was becoming a very destructive spiral because everything yeah. was around others, others, others. And once you get into that point where you realize, well, like, like the most important is your, in your life is you. And that if you are good, everybody around you can blossom. That is yeah. such a powerful and, and, and important idea that I think like that's something that, that we really, especially men, and I would like to talk about masculinity, is something yeah. that we really need to also work, you know, out, about deconstructing a lot of the myths that are around what means to be a man and really what kind of man we want to be, especially you being fa father of Liam. I think it's so beautiful for him to have a dad that he can grow up to first being friends, but also to have that mirror to look up to in which you are vulnerable, yeah. you are happy, and you, and, and you are a risk taker in the sense that you are putting your, yourself and your family first to many, many social conventions uh, and, and just giving it a shot. And, and I think that we need that more than ever. A hundred percent. I think it's very important to challenge the definition of what man enough means or what being a man means and again what i'm not just saying that latin america it has machismo because other cultures do but what is it to be a man you know is it to have big biceps and triceps and a six pack is it to bench press uh i don't know 200 pounds i don't even i don't even know how many pounds is my lot <laughs> is it to is it to have sex with lots of women is it to have six kids is it to make a lot of money is it to not cry is it to not ask for help is it to i oh i know everything what is it so at the end of the day i'm i'm just trying to to be myself you know and again we go back to understanding yourself i think a lot of these things that people do to prove that they're a man that they're just a symptom of having these fears and not being to confront them also not even knowing that you have them so for example in this in therapy and in all these courses that I've taken on personal growth I, I discovered lots of things that because every every strength has its weakness You know, every strength has its shadow. Yeah. So, for example, there's a couple of things that I've been able to discover. So when, when I was six and my parents divorced, my dad moved to another country. And while I don't remember much of my childhood, um, I think at that moment I made a decision that um, I am not enough and the world abandons people in that moment. And then... I, I, I went on this crazy, um, that I'm very grateful for journey of, of moving, of moving and moving. So I moved to El Salvador, then I moved to Mexico. Then at age 15, I moved to boarding school by myself, incredible experiences. But again, I'm alone. And, and, uh, I, I developed because I had to move and, and adjust and be resilient and meet new people and perform in school and, and be a good son. I, I developed this like <clears throat> identity where I like discipline and just, I don't, I don't need you guys. Like I, I have to, it's like a self a defense mechanism that oh, I sure. have to be here for myself. Nobody's going to save me. I have to save myself to the point that like discipline is like my superpower. I'm very consistent. You and are. I, in many ways, I love to drive the car. I love to not depend on anybody else. I love to, I love accountability. I love that's no, no wonder. That's why I picked stand up because it's just me on stage. It's me with the mic. 
I make all the decisions. If I fail, it's my fault. But if I succeed, it's me on the cover. And I love that, you know, but the shadow of that is that you sometimes create this facade where you are driving the car by yourself and and sometimes you don't bring others with you. So like this mentality of, listen, I I don't need you guys. That's like my defense mechanism, which is amazing because I've, I don't drown in many, like this moving around and this situation on my family made me be pretty much numb to goodbyes. Yeah. I like I move I'm I'm just like on to the next one, on to the next one. And I have a mission at hand. I'm very I have to nobody's going to save me. So I've just Sorry. become this machine of achievement to the point where I realized that I was deriving my self-worth from achievement and not fulfillment. Like Tony Robbins says, um a, a life of achievement without fulfillment is a very sad life. For sure. Or he he has another one. He says, I used to achieve to be happy. Now I happily achieve. So in, in December, I mean in October, right after my birthday, I had this like just a, a crisis, like like no other that I that I've ever had, where I, I would just cry. I would just cry and break down and I would come back from buying like a I don't know, something in the supermarket. And just crying, and I just couldn't understand what was happening to me. So that's why I started taking, uh, like, started seeing this therapist and everything. And and one of the things that, one of the hypotheses, I guess, is that for my entire life, for thirty four years, or pretty much since I'm six, I guess, when my parents divorced, there was a there was a tiger coming to to there was a a, a threat. You know, it's like. Okay, I have to survive. Okay, my parents divorced. Okay, the, the household is not good. Now, now I move to El Salvador. I have to adapt. Now I, ha- I move to Mexico. I have to adapt. I have to survive. Nobody's going to save me. Now I, I go to university in Toronto. I have, now I, I have to get a job and, and, and the, corporate, the corporate ladder. I'm, okay, I have to survive. And then I quit my bank job. So now I have to make money. I have to make money because this is my new venture and how am I going to be a good husband and a good dad if I'm not making money? And if I don't make money off of comedy and, and entrepreneurship, then that means I'm a failure. And then six months ago or, or like last summer for the first time, I started making more money than I used to make at the bank after four years, you know, and it seems to me like for the first time ever, there was no tiger. There, there was, there was nothing haunting me. There was nothing coming to get me and my body for 34 years was so used to a threat so used to my the mind was so used to mitigating threats but now there wasn't a threat and i just broke down i i didn't know how to how to handle this how ironic, world right? how <laughs> ironic i just didn't know and i just had to go back to square one yeah um and and I, what's, who am I? What's my identity? Who do I want to be? And I mean, it's been a, a crazy journey that I'm really grateful for, but I, I, I don't even know where to go from this, but have you no, had no, any well, si- I, similar I, I experiences? Do. I, I do, I do, because um, first and foremost, I think we need to share more these moments, right? And, yeah. and, and especially around the thing about being a man, uh, Latin America is a very chauvinistic society, you know, and, and, and you can go back to its roots, uh, but, but, but it's incredible. And the, the first step is to simply recognize that we come from a social construct in which man has to be the caregiver, he has to be the provider, yeah. he has to be the person that always has control, he has to be the person that always has to fight. So when we grow up, to so many interior and exterior uh, incentives, you know, about what has to be a man. It really shocks when you hear a man saying, I cried a lot. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't happy. Uh, I was making money and I was not happy. You know, it's so crazy because the whole idea um, of manhood is around control. It's about strength. 
And it's about, you know, being strong, either physically or uh, economically. So, so, so it's so important what, what, what you are doing or what we are doing about talking about this. It's, it's singular, right? And, yeah. and it's very important because we live in a society we, where we need more positive examples, where we need representation, where we need, you know, to, to recognize and tackle those stereotypes. And, and I think that um, by doing so, we are leaving a big legacy. So, yeah. so I really celebrate, and I think you've seen it when, because you are very public, both on your, uh, on your wins and on your fails, how people really are there, not only to celebrate your highs, but to support you in your lows, because yeah. all of us, of us have it. And, and, and at the beginning of the, the podcast, you were, saying, you, were, you were telling, you know, like describing me and saying like, well, like you seem to have control, but, but I, I, I thankfully, I don't know, you know, like I'm <laughs> this moment of my life, I don't know what I'm doing uh, uh, for one part. And then for the other part, it's just like saying like, well, I really love how to, like that I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, you know? And so, so essentially it is it, like, I'm 34. Um, thankfully, things with my with my girlfriend are looking looking so nice that both of us decided to to do a life planning exercise, and just the whole idea of being with the person that you love and that you're projecting yourself, saying like, listen, like let's have an afternoon in which we're going to start recognizing everything we have was such a cool moment because. I was very vulnerable with her. And I was like, listen, like, I feel very happy in these parts of my life, but I, I'm not so excited with this and this part. Uh, but, but first, I want you to know. Second, I want to have accountability with you. But yeah. third, it gave me so much freedom to acknowledge that the person I want to share my life with, we can plan a life together. It yeah. really took us like a lot of constraints. Like I was telling her, like, listen, like before talking to you, I felt like, like a horse with like very something very, very direct. And now, like, I, I feel like you are in this Sandra Bullock's movie and they take, you know, the, 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 the thing out of your eyes. <laughs> See, burn bugs. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I think that that's something very important because it's all right not to be all right. But I think it's even more important just to say, I don't know, you know. In a business yeah, sense, in a personal sense, and with your relationship with others, and and the more vulnerable we are, the more we connect, right? And and yeah. I think that another another thing that we, we 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 can discuss more is about how important it is to be empathic with others, but also to be compassionate with others. So so the the, the, the two things go across. At, at least is how I framework it. So empathy is the ability to connect with another person. You know, just just to create a connection. Uh, about how you're feeling and how we're feeling. And, and that is going to go around trust, about communication, and just about being able to remove from all our, our thoughts and stuff and just be present in the moment. But compassion is the ability to, to, to empathize with you and then connect with how I felt in similar situations. And yeah. why I'm talking about empathy and compassion at the same level or, or, or as how they connect is because... First, it's very important for us to develop and nurture vulnerability first with ourselves and then with others. Then it's really important to empathize and to have the ability of connecting with another person and trying to understand their, the world in, the, in his optics or her optics and, and, and try to, you know, just, just to get a sense of it. But, but third, for me, is something that I learned uh, last year is how through, through empathy, we're able to have compassion with ourselves. Yeah. And with others, because, you know, it's, it's it, and that for me blew my mind because we can connect, we can be vulnerable, we can have empathy, but then having compassion. And, and for me, compassion is maybe I don't need to have control always, which is what you were describing. Uh, or I really don't have to, to, to know what everybody's feeling, but I can connect to what I felt in those ways. And, and, and there's a, a Harvard study that Harvard has been doing for over 75 years in which they try to yeah. track what makes people happy. And I think you know it by that is that quality relationships. 100%. And, and, and for us, it's so important, you know, from a male point of view that we deconstruct and recognize what we've learned, you know, and try to, to go to another point of view. But also that within this framework of quality relationships, of have vulnerability, of have empathy, 
and of having compassion. And that, that for me at least has really changed my life and has really helped me develop better relationships. A hundred percent, man. I, I always look at life. I, I, this is like positive, um, not mediocrity, but I just, my, my entire approach to life is why would I read 27 pages if I can read four and, and get the same amount and get the same amount of satisfaction and content, especially because your attention and your willpower is finite. You only have a certain amount uh, during the day. Your energy is finite too. So I'm like, okay, what does everybody want? Like there's, there's a couple of things you can't argue with. Nobody can because it's been scientifically proven. First of all, the Harvard study, we have 80 years or whatever. Dude, you, that, you got the answers to the test. What, does people want, what do people want to do in life? They want to be happy. Do you want to be miserable? miserable? No. You want to be happy. Okay, how do you, what's the answer to the test? Is it money? No, it's not money. Is it having a six pack? No, obviously being healthy helps. The quality of your relationships. Now, that's the answer to the test. Okay, that doesn't mean you can, you can be like super unhealthy and do drugs and watch Netflix all day and be an asshole and have great relationships. No, obviously <laughs> you have to, there's a lot of things that tie into it. The other thing is people, everybody wants to be seen and heard. That's also proven. Now, that doesn't mean you want to be on the cover of the, of the magazine. That doesn't mean you want to have the mic and be the, the, the be representing everybody. You could still be an intro, but everybody, even if you're an introvert, even if you consider yourself shy, you want to feel acknowledged, which just fe means, hey, be kind, be empathetic, be compassionate, because everybody wants to feel seen and heard. And the other one that I've proven for the longest time is relationships move at the speed of vulnerability and vulnerability builds trust, period. I don't care who you are. You, if you're perfect and you do everything right and it's never your fault, you're not connecting with anybody. If you're blaming everybody, if you're being an asshole, but if you're human, if you're, if you're vulnerable, that really builds a human connection. And yeah. I don't mean you have to cry because vulnerability is not crying. You can cry, but vulnerability is courage. It's being yourself. It's having the courage to have tough conversations. It's asking for help. It's, 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 uh, at, uh, offering help. It's being yourself. It's having yep. the courage to be yourself. So I, I really, you have no idea how much I enjoy you talking about Ariana because I, I heard this quote recently where it's like the value of saying no. And it goes like this. I'm not going to say yes or no. I'm going to say hell yes or no. Yeah. And a lot of us, Sometimes I'm not just saying in relationship, but in, in jobs, in health, in trips, every time you're at a party, somebody throws an idea, you know, especially if people are drunk, they're like, yeah, we should go to Kilimanjaro. We should run a marathon tomorrow. I mean, okay, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And, and if you say yes to everything, it's going to be hard. So the value of saying no is super critical. So you can say yes to the ones that actually mattered to you. Yeah. And in order to say yes to those that actually mattered to you, you have to know what actually matters to you. So that's the process of the rewards of self-awareness, the rewards of, of becoming, taking a class for being a barista, uh, doing the scuba diving, going to Asia, going to Peru, saying no to opportunities so that uh, taking the personal growth courses to understand what really va what are you really value and for sure and, and, and you know I'm so like, happy when when you talk about ariana because it really shows and 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 like i i was just taking notes on, on some things that i were talking because i love how you recently shared how last year you you took action into that saying of say take three percent of your wealth or, or, or of your income and invested yeah. on yourself. And dude, like I was so
so like I was, I was, I felt like I was in a stadium because I was, as I was reading what you were doing and this and that, you know, I was like, go, 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 you know, like it was amazing. It was so crazy. So many books read, so many workshops, like, like learning about this and that. And, and it's amazing. And I love it that your superpower is consistency. Like I would love to have that, you know, like I, I know my superpower probably goes more into building quality relations and just like, 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 like being like a bean of light, because that's, I think that's, that's what I do. Yeah. Like I, I, I love you being are. happy. Um, and it was funny. Like once I was dating a girl and she told me, I can't believe, <laughs> why are you so happy? Like, like that's real. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, uh, are you complimenting me or is that bad? You know? <laughs> but, 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 but I think it's crazy, you know, because, because I love how through the conversation we talk about productivity and especially you and I that have a business background and a business major is crazy because a lot of the, the pressures that I'm sure you also felt during college and during your work life was that you always have to have control. You always have to have the next step. You always have to grow, grow, grow. And so I, I just wanted to point out how valuable for me it was when you said, man, I got to a low last year when I had everything in control. And the problem was that I didn't have any problems, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and that is so ironic, but that is so true, right? Because I think that 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 within this, this thing that you love to talk uh, on productivity, is that we are not machines. We, yeah. we don't, like, our, our, I, I learned last year that the biggest asset we have is not money and it's not time. It's energy, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, exactly. man, like, you can have two power hours and that's it for the day. Like, all of us have had a week or a Monday where you did something that you are like, okay, I'm set, like, this is what I have to do this week. But we are unable to just, you know, say like, okay, that's it. Close my computer and I'm going to do other stuff. And I think that that's very important because we need to move towards a less productive oriented society yeah. and into a more energy efficient society because productivity is many times measured by a lot of KPIs that really don't add value. Whereas if we <laughs> start thinking about how our time really is worth it's going to be more valuable. And, and, and then this is where I want to go. Like we have to think of ourselves as multidimensional people. Yes. Like that definition of many people is defined by their profession, right? By their so, name, by their status. And, and I think that we really have to recognize and I really, if you guys are hearing us, like please Google the, the wheel of life uh, and try to make a self-assessment uh, and how your life is doing. And, and and here's the thing, like you don't have to be a 10 in everything. Like I, I think if I, I think that it's important for us that we acknowledge that we're not going to be always on the best on one part of our life. And that it's going to be like you, I know you played FIFA a lot like myself. Like you go through players and there's this player that is very good passing, but he's not very good defending. Like <laughs> we are that also, right? Like, like we have to acknowledge what are our strengths. Maybe we're, we are not doing as good, but I think more importantly, where we want to put our energy, right? Not our so, time, not our money, like our energy. Like if we understand that we are energy driven people, we're going to have more care on our quality of our relationships, our where we spend our time professionally, of when we disconnect, of when we have family time. And I think the most important thing is when we have me time, you know, like yeah, I realized when, when I did that, that, and, and it's not even recharge. It's just like saying like, man, like for me, every day I do coffee, you know, uh, and that is my me time, you know, like that, that's something like I, I got late today because I was making a coffee, but I was like, okay, first I do my coffee and then I talk with Stefan and, yes. and that gives me energy. It gives me like a sense of realization of consistency. And I think that we have to move towards a world with our coworkers, with our couple, with our friends, in which we ask, how's your energy? Like, what are you spending your energy on? Not your time, not your money. That would be so nice, right? Because for starters, it's a new concept. But secondly, it, it, it moves you toward intention, right? It moves you toward purpose. So, so just to finish the story, yesterday, Ari and I did this life planning 
And, and I mean, we took six hours. It was so crazy, but it was so nice because we were just like hustling. Like there was a moment where I was like, I oh, man, like we're writing so much. Like I, I, I designed the <laughs> workshop and I was like, I'm so tired. And then we were like, no, like I'm going to pour myself a whiskey and let's continue talking. And we ended up like really, really like so happy that we took six hours of a Sunday on us and our relationship. And I think like, wow, like it really gave you a new framework of doing so. So, so just to finish, like, I, I just want to put into the table the concept of, about being energy driven humans, you know, and, and where we spend our energy and our energy is not time, right? It's just like, uh-huh. like, like sometimes you can have like the, the smallest WhatsApp audio that is going to give you energy or you're going to have like, you're going to be in a place where it's like Harry Potter, like where you have the, the Dementors <laughs> and you're just like complete. Yes. So, you know, you talked about <laughs> that. Yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah. A year ago to me. That's so brilliant. Can, can, yeah, the, can, you, can you just do a, like elaborate on the Dementors? Because that's so good. <laughs> okay, so Harry Potter. <laughs> so, so, so in Harry Potter, I, uh, uh, I was a big bookworm of, of Harry Potter. But essentially, like there was these beings that were like kind of ghosts. And they would identify and suck like your energy from your biggest fear. And, and, and I think that we have to understand where are our dementors, you know? And, and, and the, the cool thing was that during the books that you really learned that the, the biggest power was when you learn what was your biggest fear and you could cope with it because then it, it, it could give you a shield or it could make you bulletproof towards yeah. others taking your energy. And, and why do I say this with, with, with so emphasis? Because... I mean, it's not bad to be fearful. It's not bad to have our weaknesses. I, the, the, the important thing is to identify it. And, 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 and oh. as I told you before, let's recognize it. Let's talk about it. And let's make it vulnerable. Like you say, with Adi, she knows I have a big thing around order. Like it was interesting because yesterday we we're making an exercise. was like, what are your pains and gains in, a, in, in life? You know, and for me, one gain is to have order, but I am not organized. Like if you would see my office, it's a complete <laughs> disaster. And I'm always like, I want to organize it. But then along came Adi and she helped me organize. So I was like, okay, good. You know, uh, or so, I'm a last minute shopper and she's not. And so it's like really cool because if you know, like what is something that you it's a pain. And then what's something that is a gain. So I was like, okay, so listen, like if you want to, like, I always thought like I wanted to make a company made for men in which the survey was buying gifts because I hate buying gifts. Like I'm yes. not good at it. Like on the 25th of, of December, I would be at 10 AM just when the, the <laughs> shops open, just buying like 20 things for all my family because it gives me anxiety. And then somehow happens that my girlfriend bought me all the tick, all the gifts like from October. So it's like what you know. So so, so it's like leave control to things like you don't like. Recognize your dementors, and yes. then on the other was just like let yourself help and 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 cherish your energy. Dude, I, that that's really about what my productivity machine workshop is, and I'm changing the name because it gives it a wrong idea, and and I'm kind of changing the name because it's actually freeing up time for what matters being productive is subjective you know and like you said energy is finite it's like a video game if you you only have a hundred units of energy a day so use them wisely because at 2 p.m you might have run out of energy because you ran into a dementor you know (laughs) so but i'm gonna challenge you a little bit with what you're saying and i remember that we played i think it was mortal kombat or street fighter but yeah. you, you remember that you could start, you know, Sub Zero against one of the other guys, Scorpion in in Mortal Kombat, and if they would do like this super kick, you would die literally like yeah. three seconds into the <laughs> fight. And I think that we have to think ourselves in those terms because then again, productivity is always in the, uh, doing, doing, doing. And one of the concepts that I love to grasp, I think it was two years ago, it was about cherishing not having things to do, you know, like just, just uh-huh. having time to be bored. And so in that sense, it's like, like maybe you have 100 energy for a day or for a, an hour, like 
just it, 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 it's so difficult because then again comes an elementor and it takes up not your day, not your month, but even your your month or your year. You know, like yeah. when you are depressed, when you're struggling with something, you don't have energy. It, 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 it's it's like so crazy, right? And and I'm sure like it's your case when after you started acknowledging and then going to the therapy and stuff that you started seeing how maybe overnight your tank passed from zero to five and then from five to 10 and then from 10 to 100. And then you're like, what? Like what happened? It, it, it's crazy. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with what you're saying because now <clears throat> a lot of people see it as doing more in less time and achieving and achieving and achieving. But watching a Barcelona game for us is productive. Is. Are we making money off of it? No, we're, we're probably losing money, but, but, uh, but it's super productive. I derive value from it. I derive satisfaction, not achievement, but satisfaction and happiness and well-being plenitude. So, that is product. So it, it can change. It's is spending a, a, a two hours with my son outside productive. A hundred percent it is. is, is making a call and making $10,000 in a couple workshops for a hundred percent it is. But um, if I'm, if I, if I'm really, really, really low because I just hit a brick wall, um, it may be doing what you got to do so that you can, free up time for what matters. And what matters is making an appointment with a therapist. So, but if you spend it on the, on the little things on the, on the useless things, those could take away more energy. Like for example, <clears throat> I'll just give this example. If cleaning the house is a, it's I, man, I hate it. I just really hate it. It's not just a task. It's just, it's a dementor for me. It takes away yeah. my energy. And, and that could take like three or four hours between me and my wife. But if I pay $120 for somebody to clean my house once a month, dude, it's so worth it because your hour, what's your hour? How much is worth your hour? Yeah. How much is worth one hour of your energy? Because energy and inspiration are perishable. So yeah. once you have it, you got, you have to double down on it. Because it may not come back, like you said, may, like your tank may be five tomorrow. Because because it's it, it just it's just gone. So I love it. I love it. And, and again, um, another one of the truths is that the in, the people who have accomplished great things in life, extraordinary things, extraordinary recurring long term things, have done them by doubling down on their strengths. Yeah. And not mitigating their weaknesses. Obviously, you have to mitigate them to perform at a specific level, <clears throat> but double down on your strengths. And and it's like the chicken or the egg. Are you really good at something because you're passionate, or you're passionate because you're good at it? And and like, yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I think you're passionate. Because you're good. No, I think you're good at it because you're passionate. It doesn't matter. I think both of them work. But regardless, no, but, but. double down on your strengths. So that self-awareness is very important. And then you, hopefully, the things that you're good at, because you're good at them, you will enjoy them. And then you will become, you will be able to have a, a good, make, like make some money so that you don't have to spend all day working in an office and doing things that you hate. And then exactly. because you're productive, you free up time for what matters. In my case, watching Barcelona, spending time with my wife, spending time with my kid um, at like, I don't know, watching national geographic animals, hunting each other, yeah. like all these things matter to me. What but do you in think? That, in that sense, I, I, I would like to, 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 to get into a point. And it's first that, I mean, my grandmother is 102 years old and it's crazy when you when you think about the perspective she has on life just because yeah. she's 102 years old and she actually became an example for me to try to design my life because i said well if my grandmother is 102 years old that means i could potentially get to live 80 years old you know so so what is going to be something that when I get to my 80th birthday is going yeah. to provide me 
happiness. You know, it's going to make me proud. It's going to say that I, I lived a life worth living of, right? Because I think ultimately that is the thing that I've seen around death. You know, like yeah. last week, uh, the, the, the grandmother of a very good friend of mine passed away. And it was, it was so interesting because the, the memorial was like this blend as it should be of mourning and celebration. And it's interesting how death many times gives you a perspective either of I regret or either I celebrate. And I think like many times we live in a society where we have so many impulses on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram that everybody's crushing it, that everybody's doing good, that we're looking great, that we're so happy. Uh, but are we really living a life that we're worth celebrating? And I remember when my dad, when my father died, it was his memorial was a celebration of his life. And I was the one that spoke and I told to everyone, listen, like, like, I don't want you to, to feel sorry for us. I'm happy for my father. Like, I mean, like, I would love him to still be alive, but I'm so happy of what I grew, I developed, I created with him that we have to start seeing life as a celebration of what we do yeah. or as a possibility of what we can celebrate. So, so I, I, I don't like many times that we have like this, we see so many impulses of this person is successful. This person is happy this per yeah, because yeah, yeah. I will, they want to celebrate their life many times. Yes. But many times you see people that for us have everything, but they are a poor rich, you know? And, and I yeah. think that we have to come back at least to, 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 to our grandparents or to people that have longevity and to ask them, like, what do they cherish? What do they see? And, and in my case, like, that's something that we have to learn from the elders and, and the kids, you know, like Liam, like I, I see Liam, how he's growing, how happy he is, how he's like so curious. And, and we have to learn, you know, from those two spectrums of life, which intentionally are those that we think we have to take more care most of, but I think it's the one that we have to give more energy because we can learn a lot from that. A hundred percent. And I, I, that's why I kind of phrased the course to free up time for what matters, because it may be unrealistic for a lot of people to just say, Hey, I'm moving to an Island to live la vida loca and not make any money for the rest of my life and drink pina colada. I mean, be, because of the, the year that we're, I guess, 2022, a lot of people have to work and, but too many, I think a lot of people work too much. And I think that we need to free up more time for what matters for our relationships, for our well being. I mean, it should be a priority. It shouldn't even be freeing up time. It, sh it should be a priority, you know? But I, I love what you said about death because that's another certainty. And it's very consistent that people who are about to die, uh, they don't regret. Oh, I should have sent a couple more emails on, on that Thursday night, you know? They don't okay. regret, oh, I should have worked harder. No, I mean, the regrets are maybe I should have traveled more. I should have spent more time with my family. I should have told people I love you. That's a big one. And, and um, when you design, when you do your life by design and you, and you free up time for what matters, when you do the wheel of life, when you understand yourself more, then you can assess those things, you know? And, and here's the cool thing. Um, I mean, <laughs> the best moment to design the life that you want is right now. Not because ah. you're going to, you, because you're going to have a design because, I mean, uh, I also like to talk a lot about innovation. And, and the cool thing about innovation is not that, that you have to be focused on the final result, rather on the process or what you learn by pivoting, right? So, so something that really ignited me yesterday to do that exercise with Adi was that that wall that I know you have on your right where you have like all those uh -huh. stuff because yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. so beautiful that that you have at, at least identified the things that are important to you it doesn't mean that you're going to accomplish all it doesn't mean uh -huh. that you're going to go to plan but I, I was telling Adi yesterday it was like listen like why don't we identify the things that are important to us and it was so beautiful. This is something that I, I wanted to emphasize, uh, and I had a plan of saying it today. Um, 
So, so two years ago, I, I, I began this course on, on nonviolent communication, and they were talking how the principles of nonviolent communication comes from a, the fact that people make their best effort to satisfy their unsatisfied needs, right? So, wow. so if you see life through that prism is that every time that you have a con- a, an interaction, not only with others, but with ourselves, we're trying to satisfy a need. Like a baby cannot talk, but he's going to express so that people understand that he's hungry, that he is sleepy, that he is having an ache. He's making his best effort to do so. And our relationships are going to derive from how we understand and we recognize that the person in front of me, or even myself, I am trying to make my best effort to satisfy an unsatisfied need. And so it's very important for us to have a very big emotional um, language, right? Because that way we can be very specific on how we're feeling. So if you're listening to this, Go to Google and try to look for the emotions wheel, which is, I know, I, I feel like yeah. I'm still tired, but, but it's very important <laughs> and it's very interesting because typically when you ask someone how you're doing, they're going to be, yeah, fine or, well, not good, right? But if we are able to have a vocabulary that has more than 30 emotions on it, we're going to be more connected individuals first with ourselves and then with others. So yesterday... One of the exercises that Ari and myself were doing was, okay, let's try to develop compromises, like things that are important to us. And it was so symbolic because we were able to reach 30 compromises. And those 30 compromises were were more like feelings, like needs, you know, like a sense of compassion. Like we want to have a compassionate relationship. We want to have, and I have it over here. Um, we want to have a relationship Okay, it's over here. Uh, where we have solidarity, with, where we have purpose, uh, where we have gratitude, where we have respect, where we have adventure. And so imagine how specific that is for designing a life in couple, right? Because we didn't talk about wealth. We were talking about well-being. We weren't talking no. about a lifestyle. We were talking about what uh, money or time enables us to, right? So, so I would just like to finish uh, this conversation with, 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 with saying that it's very important for us to develop an emotional language and to understand that the quality of relationship with others is going to be based on how we are able to understand that that person is making its best effort to satisfy its unsatisfied needs. Uh, and and so, that for me completely changed my mind, but it also enabled us, right? Uh, and this is uh, the, all the words that we have. It's amazing. But, 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 but the nice thing was that we really ended up this planning exercise with a sense of fulfillment, but also that we were focusing on what matters most. And, yeah. and, and I think that's the most, most, most valuable thing that first you can do with yourself and then with, with the persons that you care with. Definitely. On my wall, I have like skiing once, playing poker once with my friends. I mean, I have a lot of uh, joining a running group, um, all these little things, volunteer at a women's shelter with a friend that has done it like a hundred times. And, and uh, going back to your point, as we cap off this uh, life changing conversation, <laughs> one of the biggest, one of the biggest like emotional intelligence is more likely to predict success in a person than IQ. And I mean, I know that success is subjective as well, but what I'm trying to say that emotional intelligence is a person being able to identify their emotions. So if you're able to put a name on your emotions, by definition, you have emotional intelligence. And by definition, that is more likely to predict you having a successful life, a meaningful life, a, 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 una, una vida con plenitud. And, mm. and like you said, everything arises in language. So uh, Google the wheel of life, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I'm going to send it to you on WhatsApp, but I, I really enjoyed this conversation because, um, I mean, we, we, I love that we have debunked certain things that are, at least ingrained in where we grew up with and yeah. on, on, on manhood, for instance, and wealth and uh, on, on, on jobs, you know, and having control of your life. Uh, 
and also uh, uh, and trying to focus on things that are important vulnerability quality of relationships intentionality uh, emotional connections right and and also getting to know ourselves so i don't know i'm i'm i, I really i'm very happy that you have developed this space i love that you are the king of consistency I, I really have learned a lot, you know, so you made my intro. I'm going to make the outro on you <laughs> <laughs> because because I think it's really interesting, right? Like, so if you haven't met Stefan, Stefan is, is very curious because he has a persona where you see him uh, on his programs and his podcast. But then when you are in person, you are rather an introvert, right? Like you're very analytical. Yeah. You, you yeah, Like yeah. once I met Stefan, I hadn't seen Stefan for five years. And I was like, dude, like where's the Vine guy, right? Like where's the Instagram guy, <laughs> the funny guy that, and, and he was like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but one thing that I love is the capacity that you have to be consistent. And I think that yeah. that is that, that 20, that, that if, if 2022 can be a year for me in which I can be consistent, it's going to be a great year because I know I'm like a nuclear reactor of ideas, of energy, <laughs> but sometimes I struggle with consistency. And ironically, the times I felt the happier with myself is when I'm more consistent. And it's not in productivity terms of, of task, but more on focusing on things that are important for me. And that derives for me a uh, prosperity, or at least feeling that I'm that I have I'm plentiful, right? Um, and I think that it's it's so important that you have developed a lifestyle in which you you acknowledge vulnerability, in which you foster communication, in which you foster something that is very Costa Rican as happiness, of laughing, you know, uh -huh. of having connections, but above all, that you are teaching and that you're sharing what you do. Because um, I think we need that more. We, we, we need to understand that no one is an Avenger, that no one has superpowers, that, that, that everybody has the mentors, and that it's important to acknowledge it. So that someone that has influence, like yourself, with your corporate trainers, with your friends, with your, in your comedy programs or in your podcast, can talk about it. That's so, so important. So, so really, thank you very much for, for inviting you, me man. and for creating this platform. Thank you, Alia, man. I I so enjoy this conversation. And the last the last tradition is the champagne question for every guest. And it goes Go like it. this. If we were to meet a year from now with a bottle of champagne in 2023, what are we celebrating in Alejandro Ejea's life? Oof. Okay, so first, I think that every time that we see each other personally, it's a celebration on itself. Yeah. Um, but second, you know, like I, I, I would like to go, I, I would really like to come with this being a year of being consistent and uh, 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 of being truthful to, to, to what I've done. So really one of the things why I wanted to do yesterday the workshop with Adi was because I wanted that to become into a wall, right? And, and that's something that I really learned from you. So, so I think consistency is going to be something that I would like to become publicly, a, how do you say, a, in which you, you have este, ¿cómo es que se llama? Oh. A Kanban board? No, okay. yeah, like the board, but more or less, like what I want to be is accountable with you or, or ah. with you guys, you know? Yes. Like consistency is something that I want to celebrate because that's something that I struggle with and that I know that I have a lot of those pieces, but I think that consistency in, in my energy and in my relationship is going to be something very valuable. Man, I'm so happy you said that. I'll, I'll come to my productivity machine workshop with Adi. And it's a lot about consistency as well. A lot of tips and hacks and tricks. Uh, I'll send you, I'll send you guys some complimentary tickets Sunday, February 17, 9 a.m. Eastern time. We'll see you there. And for the time being, my friend, I'm I'm so proud of you. Thank you for being here. I love you. I love Adi. I don't even know her, but I love her uh, <laughs> by association. <laughs> by association, for sure. A big hug oh, to your mom, you. your, your mom's husband, Mao, everybody. And uh, uh, thank you for being there in my life 100%, man. No, thank you, too. And I think, like, we are the best example of how important quality relationships are. Yeah. Uh, Stefan and I were very close friends when we were in school and we became so much like that. And I really 
cherish and recognize the importance of really that you and I always like prioritize our time. Like whenever we talk, uh -huh. it's like very, very intentional. And I think that's something that I, I, I like to put my money where my mouth is. Uh, and in this case, it's just like having quality relationships. So thank you for that. And thank you for having me in the show. And what a great second season. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Big hug, my friend. Alejandro here. Yeah. <laughs> and Stefan Dyer on the Stefan Dyer Podcast. Ciao, ciao. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer Podcast. Arrivederci, my people.